My charge will be to speak about resistance to integrase inhibitors, and I will try to put this in a very clinical context, uh, building on uh, the concepts that Charles uh, introduced. So these are my disclosures. If someone knows a company that I don't take money from, please let me know, and I'll work on it. Uh, and also, as a disclaimer, I'm going to be speaking about some investigational drugs, and obviously, uh, we use these only in clinical trials uh, and just as a, as a concept. So we have three approved integrase inhibitors, raltegravir, elvitegravir, and dolutegravir, and two investigational. Uh, we have quite a bit of data on cabotegravir, uh, including clinical data. And now we have some preliminary data on Bictegravir, but since both of these drugs are in advanced clinical development, I will discuss them as well because I think uh, we may be seeing them in the clinic uh, pretty soon. And I really think we can divide this into first and second generations. Uh, and I think the resistance characteristics of the integrase inhibitors of the first generation are different of those uh, from the second generation. And I think for us clinicians, that also has uh, significance. So this is the structure of raltegravir. This is the structure of elvitegravir. And you can see they're sort of bulky molecules that stick out. And this is dolutegravir, much more streamlined, as we would say in English. And now we have an additional uh, integrase inhibitor, bictegravir. And if you look, you can see there are sort of differences in the structure between our first generation, which are sort of bulkier, and our second generation that are more streamlined. And we have one more second generation. This is dolutegravir, bictegravir. And how do you think cabotegravir is going to look? Again, similar. So our second generation drugs really do have similar characteristics, which indeed will probably result in similar resistance characteristics. So going back to uh, the, some of the basics that Charles showed us, we see here, let me see if you can see here, this is an integrase inhibitor sitting in the active site. And I'm going to rotate this to face you, OK? So I'm going to turn it around. Now it's facing you. Here's the inhibitor. And we have an active site. Now, as Charles mentioned, you can't change the key amino acids, which actually do the work. So what the virus wants to do, it wants to change all the amino acids around the active site and give us these mutations to interfere with the action of the inhibitor. But it's tricky for the enzyme. On the one hand, it can't change the actual cutting inside, the actual mechanism, but it does want to change it. So it sort of, it looks for every little thing that's different between the substrate and the drug. So wherever our inhibitor will flop out of the active site, we'll get a mutation. So take a look at this. This is raltegravir and dolutegravir, one on top of the other. And you can see here, here's the white and red. This is raltegravir, and the green is dolutegravir. And see if you can see, it, they've tightened it up. It doesn't flop out as much. It's much more tighter, and it sits more tightly in the active site. And that is a way of getting less interactions between the inhibitor and the mutations. So this isn't by chance. When the company was developing it, the scientists didn't look just for a, vir a, a drug which would inhibit the wild-type virus. They looked for a drug that would inhibit the mutant virus. And you can see here in clinical development, these are all different versions of early dolutegravir, and they took a virus that had the 148K mutation, and they kept testing the structures against these until they finally came up with a molecule which just had a little bit of resistance. This is how much resistance you have to this um, mutation. So it was a very active process in making it tighter and smaller so each mutation would impact it less. And indeed, the amount of resistance you get from single mutations to delotegavir is small. And this is a picture you may have seen before. What are, what are we doing here? If we look over here, on the side here, the higher you are, the more resistance, the more fold change resistance. So 
up is bad. That means you have a lot of resistance. And these are single mutations, and these are combination mutations. And we're asking here for each drug, how much resistance do they have to each one of these mutations or combination of mutations? So the higher you up, the more it is. So yellow is l vitegravir and if you look, you'll see a lot of resistance, especially when you have combinations of mutations. If you look at raltegravir, it's a little bit better, but still a lot of resistance. But look at the blue. Look at dilutegravir. You do have resistance, but it's much, much less. And that was the process of making it tighter, sitting more tightly in the active site that produces less resistance to the mutations. So why do we care about this so much? What's the big deal about making it so small? Why do we want to have? Because we want a high genetic barrier. And a genetic barrier is a function both of virology and of pharmacology. And you've probably heard this before, but let's just do it again together for a second. We have our drug level, right? And it changes over time. And we want this to be above the level we need to inhibit the virus, right? So this is the drug level you need to inhibit the, the wild type virus. We want to be above it. And we want to be above it all the time. So even when we're at our C min, at our lowest level, we want to be above it. So let's just look at these two lines. So we want our lowest level to always be well above the wild type. So you could sort of think this is the genetic barrier, but it's not the genetic barrier. It's just part of it. And one important aspect of a genetic barrier, of course, is when we take the drugs and we put them in the body, a lot of the drug gets sucked up by the proteins in the blood. So we don't actually have that level. We have much less. So we have to correct for protein binding, and therefore we often have to give more of the drug. We're going to have to give a higher level to correct for protein binding. So there's a drug level that actually is more because a lot of that isn't active. So is this a genetic barrier? What's missing? What's missing is how much resistance does that worst mutation give us? Because if we are not above the level to inhibit the most potent single mutation, the minute we have failure, that mutation is there and the drug has resistance, and that is low genetic barrier. So a key a key to having a high genetic barrier drug is not being above the level you need for the wild type virus, it's being above the level you need for that single mutation which is all the time developing. And that is crucial. And that's why this is so important. So if you have a drug where the single mutation doesn't give a lot of resistance, you have a potential for a high genetic barrier drug. You can still be way above it. But what happens if a single mutation gives you lots of resistance? It's way up high now, the level. You'll never get to that level. And numbers you might hear, for, if it's only threefold, that's not a lot of resistance. We might be able to still be above it. But if it's 30-fold, we'll never be able to get above it. And that'll definitely be a low genetic barrier drug. Now, at the Stanford database, we actually have a lot of data on how much resistance single mutations give to each drug. And you can actually look it up, and it shows you the spread, and we have sort of a mean. So if you look here at lopinavir, and V82A is a common mutation to lopinavir, how much, how much resistance does it give? Well, on the average, it's about 1.8, not a lot. What about I84V, another mutation? 1.9. And darunavir? to I84V, 1.3. Not the worst mutation, but the mutation mutation will be two, two and a half, but these are the numbers. So what about nevirapine, an NNRTI, and the K103N? How much resistance on the average does K103N give to nevirapine? 94. Different ballpark. And if average to K103N, 32. So these are very different numbers. And it will impact how much resistance we get. Now, this is not by chance. Darunavir was designed to have less resistance to the individual mutation. This is a while ago, but the smart folks at Tibutech actually looked at amprenavir. 
And among other things, they said, you know, amprenivir is a good drug, but when they looked at the structure, this is amprenivir in the active side of protease. Take a look at the corner here. You see it, how it's bulking out over there? So when they designed the runivir, they took that and they folded it in. And by folding it in and making the runivir more tight, they reduced the amount of resistance that individual mutations give. And, and take a look. This is from our, from our Stanford uh, database. It's not that the runivir doesn't give resistance to the same mutations. Look at all these mutations. If you take the mutations here, V32I, L33F, 54L, 84V, 50V, they impact both fosfamprenivir and darunavir. Darunavir has resistance. But look at the score on the Stanford database for fosfamprenivir and for darunavir. And you'll see that in every instance, you get much more resistance with fosfamprenivir than with darunavir. So by folding it in, by, by, by working on a tighter molecule, they were able to get for darunavir a higher genetic barrier. Now, we don't know about lopinavir, but my guess is that they looked at ritonavir, and Abbott did a similar process, although they never published it. So in this way, getting a lower fold resistance increases your genetic barrier, this changing. And it translates, because if we put in the numbers here and we take the degree of resistance here, these are the plasma level of darunavir, this is how much you need to inhibit the single mutation. Look how high you are above it. You indeed have a high genetic barrier drug. And if you look for lopinavir, also a high genetic barrier drug. Now let's take a favorins. Actually, for a favorins, you get great drug levels, very high. And even if you correct for protein binding, you're way above what you have to be to inhibit the wild type. So what's the problem? Why is a favorite not a high genetic barrier drug? Well, how much will that single mutation give me? It will give me, sorry, 32-fold. And where will the level be that I have to get above? Look where it is. It's way up here. So the minute that mutation comes in, boom. It can replicate, and we're not inhibiting anymore. So when integrase inhibitors were designed, all this, all these concepts were important. So this is our genetic barrier looking at the fold resistance for nevirapine and nefavirins, and we can see here 94, 32. And if you look at lopinavir and darunavir, the worst mutation, 3.8 for lopinavir, about 3 for darunavir, totally different. So what about our integrase inhibitors? How much does a single mutation give to our integrase inhibitors? Well, this is l and raltegravir, and no one was worrying about genetic barrier. We were just delighted to have these drugs. And this is for each one of them, how much resistance do these key mutations get? And this nasty 148R gives a huge amount of resistance. 118 for l 30 for l might, some might say it's 90 and 32, but these are the kind of numbers. So if you take this and you add it now and you look, you can see that the fold change tells you this is much more like an NRTI than a boosted PI, and we're not surprised that they're low genetic barrier drugs. But what happens if you look now at Dilutegravir? What does it look more like? looks more like a boosted PI. So this isn't by chance. This is what folks were working on to have it, but it, it, it gives us insight on why this would be a high genetic barrier drug. So we have a new investigational uh, integrase inhibitor. We only have data from the company. It's preliminary, but the drug is now in phase three, so I'd like to, to share this with you. So the development of Bictegravir was very similar to Dilutegravir, and again, they kept working on the structure to get the structure as tight as possible, and the preliminary data suggests that they have similar characteristics. One, it's again, not validated in the clinic, preliminary data, but a drug I think you'll hear more about. Now, this is a key issue. This is just looking at wild type, nothing to do with resistance. How potent is the drug? So how potent is the drug against the wild type? And if you look here, Bictegravir, Dilutegravir, they're all the same. So second generation drugs are not more potent. If you're looking for potency, that's not what was going on here. 
Valtegravir is super potent. El Valtegravir suit, there's no difference. That's not the difference. We didn't get drugs which have more potency. We have drugs where their pharmacology and resistance characteristics are different, but this is not where it's at. It is not the potency issue. So remember this figure we did for dolutegravir? Remember higher up is worse and lower up is better and the blue is dolutegravir? Well, let's now look at the data that Gilead showed for bictegravir. So the two ones in the back, this is elvitegravir, this is raltegravir, this is dolutegravir, and the yellow in front is bictegravir. And you can see that similar to dolutegravir, at least in the laboratory, it seems to have lower levels. It seems to look like a second generation drug. And here's a bigger panel. And again, look at the two front ones, the two back ones. First generation, second generation. And if you compare just the two of them, you can see how similar. Now this is data from the company, and, and here if you look carefully, the Lutegravir looks higher, so Bictegravir looks even tighter. And they did a lot of work in the laboratory looking at this. This is another way of looking at it. Um, this is, uh, instead of going up, when you go here, you have more resistance. So this is reduced susceptibility. This is increased resistance, greater fold change. So instead of going up, they're going here. And this is looking at different mutations. So raltegravir is yellow, elvitegravir is blue. And as you'd expect, you have a lot of resistance when you have mutations. Bictegravir is in green and delutegravir in purple, much less. First, second generation. And when they took nasty mutations, of course, these guys were all very, very resistant. They saw small differences in some of them between the two. Now, these are very small differences, and it'll be interesting for us to see if this has any significance. I look at this as a clinician, and I'm sure many of the folks here who treat highly uh, resistant patients, when a patient fails the lutegravir, a very common pattern they have are these three mutations, 138, 140, 148. Sometimes it's K, sometimes it's H, but when you see these three, we're, we know we're in trouble, because this is a patient where delotegravir is not going to work well. And I looked from their data to see what's the difference for this mean mutation between bictegravir and delotegravir, again, only in the laboratory. So delotegravir is 63-fold, bictegravir is 19-fold. Will there be a clinical difference? And I'm not sure. I'm not sure once you get to these levels, it will matter. And this is fascinating for me. What I'm dying to do, I'm dying to see in a patient who's failed the lutegravir and have this pattern, and he's put on bictegravir if the virus is going to go down two logs or not. If not, then all this laboratory stuff doesn't really interest me as a clinician. And I'm very cautious. I'm very skeptical. Because when I see numbers like 19 and 63, I'm not sure we'll have any difference at all. So as clinicians, this is, this is interesting. I'll show you a little bit more. But how this translates to the clinic, we've learned a lot of lessons that not always um, this means something to us as clinicians. So this is data on bictegravir at 10 days. And you can see suppression was good. This is definitely not uh, better than we've seen for others. But the best dose was 100 milligrams. And 100 milligrams is moving forward uh, in advanced clinical trials. And from this data, they sort of looked at the genetic barrier using what we call IQ. So this is how high are you uh, above what you need. And you can see it that at the 100 milligram dose, it's 25.9. That's really high. Now, we have data like this for delotegravir as well. Remember we had the study where they give different doses of delotegravir, and they all actually looked very good. And the company did the same thing and generated the IQ. And back then, this is already quite a few years ago, for the standard dose of 50 milligram, it was 19. So you put these two together on the same slide, 100 milligrams of bictegravir is giving you 25.9, 50 milligrams of delotegravir is giving you 19. Uh, this is IC90, this is IC95. Is this gonna be different? To us clinicians, is this of any value? It'll be interesting to see. I think uh, we need to wait. I think we're interested in these data. Each of these were generated by, by the companies. I would like everyone to give, you know, Charles 
in his lab and for him to do this objectively between the two to give us insight. But this will have to be correlated um, when we go into the clinic and see how this works. So these are the characteristics, and I hope you're convinced that first and second generation are different. So what, what does that matter to us as clinicians? What, what's the significance of all this uh, to us? So first of all, when you lose low genetic barrier drugs, resistance accumulates. And we know that if you fail a pharynx and a varipine and you stay on the drug, boom, those NRTI mutations just start piling on. And this is a study done by the folks at Merck, I think a very good study. This was when they used Raltegravir in salvage. They gave it in salvage, and the patients who failed the salvage regimen really didn't have anything else, so they kept the patient on. And these were patients who had failed Raltegravir and stayed on Raltegravir a long time. And what the company did is they kept on sequencing the virus to see if it was accumulating more and more mutations. And between each of these is a few months. So this is like from here to here a few months, and this is a few more months. This is the first genotype, the second genotype, the third genotype. This is viruses with one mutation to integrase, two or three or more. So at the first time point, some patients had one, most two, and almost no had, none had three. But if you kept, left the patient on raltegravir, you didn't switch, look what happened. Almost none had one, all had either two or three, and at the third time point, everybody had either two or three or four mutations. So leaving a patient who's failing on raltegravir will accumulate more and more mutations. Now, they did great work, and they actually showed us for each patient what the genotype did. What was the genotype at each time point? So if you do this in a very amateur way, and you take our interpretation of, of delutegravir, when delutegravir still works, if you look at this first time point and say, how many of these patients would have good activity of delutegravir? About half. This is like full activity. So that's, that's really good. But let's say you waited and kept the patient on to the second genotype. That's down to about 35%. And the last one is down to 22%. So th these are general numbers, but it, it, it really is showing us that leaving the patient on a first generation will sacrifice your ability to give the others. But okay, so that's, you know, if the patient fails, they fail. But what about low level of iremia? That's where I'm often challenged. I get these calls, you know, the patient has 150 copies, then they're, you know, 60, and then it's 280, and uh, they're doing so well, you know, you're a resistance guy, is anything happening? So look at this nice data, looking at low level viremia. So this is, this is very nice, this is a, a French study, and they took patients uh, that, they, that they had treated who were salvage patients. So these were 48 highly treatment experienced patients. They were receiving salvage regimens that all had two NRTIs and a boosted PI for sure, and then had an NRTI and or raltegravir. So many of these were like trio patients, right? Where you gave like darunavir, tonavir, or traverin, raltegravir, we did those, but these were those that went down but had low level of iremia. They had 48 like this. And they defined low level of iremia, I think, nicely between 50 and 500 copies. So these are patients who are getting this trio regimen, including raltegravir, and were almost undetectable. Less than 500, but had persistent low-level viremia, and they took patients where they had at least three genotypes. At least three genotypes six months apart, and on the average, they were 11 months apart. And what they did is they genotyped the first one, and the last one, 11 months later, to see was resistance accumulating at these very low levels. And take a look, nice, nice data. Okay, so this is each drug class, NRTI, NRTI, PI integrase, and these are the different mutations. The gray are the mutations present at the first low level of iremia, and the dark are the ones that had accumulated on the third one. And you can see, you added, for all of these, you added more resistance, even at low level of iremia. So two things that I calculated from, from this nice study. First of all, for me, I'm always worried that I'll lose my darunavir with this low level of iremia. That always concerns me. 
10% develop new major darunavir mutations. And this works for me. I'll tell you why it works for me. Because usually, when I look at these patients, like I, I follow them for like six or nine months, they're doing OK. And I say, good, you know what? They're doing OK. And they should, because it's only 10%. But this tells me that if I leave this patient on for years, many, many will probably ultimately fail. So it's slow, but you are generating even darunavir mutations. And for our talk, for raltegravir, despite the fact that darunavir was protecting it, and despite the fact that it was low level, two of the nine developed mutations to raltegravir. So even at low levels, and even with a protease inhibitor, you are selecting. And that's important because clinically, we often debate what's happening at you know, 200 copies. And another thing, which I think we should remember, from clinical trials, it always sounds like you have just a little bit of resistance for the drug being studied, right? I'll give you an example. Here's the study we all know, the SPRING-2 study. Head-to-head, -head, raltegravir and delotegravir in drug-naive patients, they both did fantastic, and we saw the resistance data. Of those who failed, none of the delotegravirs had resistance, and 6% had raltegravir resistance. 6%? That's not bad. In my clinic, I see more when, I, when they fail. Now, why is that? Because these patients are very closely followed, and the minute they fail, they leave the study. So what was the viral load when they failed and they did the genotype? In 82%, less than 400. So yes, if you switch your patient at less than 400, then you'll have 6%. But many of us don't know the patients failed until they have 1,000 or 5,000. And that's why in our clinics we see much more. And by the way, we had a lot of data presented now on Elvitegravir, on Stribald and Genvoya showing almost no resistance, which is great, but these were clinical trials where the patients um, were failing at, again, less, more than 50. So if you do a genotype there, it's very little, but in our clinics, we, of course, will see more. So despite the high genetic barrier, second-generation integrase inhibitors are not immune to resistance. When you give them with two NRTIs in drug-naive patient, current data suggests that if you use dilutegravir, you will not see failure. So we, we have this thing where we say, oh, you don't get resistance to, to, to second-generation. No, what we actually know is if you take a drug-naive patient, and you give the delotegravir, either with the back of your 3TC or with tenofovir FTC, they will not fail with resistance. We have lots of data. We have data from our patients. We have data from clinical trials, from cohorts. That we know. Everything else has not yet been proven. So we should be cautious from extrapolating this to other situations, like mono or dual therapy, treatment experience patients, or other investigational second generation where we just say, oh, it's going to be the same. Well, maybe it will. So what about investigational? Well, we're accumulating a lot of data with carbotegravir, and it's similar, but it's not the same. This is looking, remember those, how much resistance? This is looking at carbotegravir and delotegravir. The green is carbotegravir. It's a little bit higher, but not that trivial. And if we look at the 148R mutation, that mean mutation, there's a difference. It's 1.2 for dilutegravir. It's 5.1 for cabo. So cabo is good, but it's not as good. And if you remember in the Lattice study where it was given at different doses with rilpivirine, well, there's a dose that was not used in the end. It was a 10 milligram low dose. And one of those patients wasn't adherent and all these things, and it finally failed with a Q148R. Now, we never saw that with dilutegravir. Even in patients failing with poor adherence on triomeg, that was not seen. And it's true, it's just one patient, and it's with 10 milligrams. We don't give 10 milligrams, but it taught us that this is not, you cannot abuse the drugs in any way and not get resistance. And we have a study um, which looks at using uh, delutegravir uh, in other ways. And folks have been using it in monotherapy, in dual therapy, and it's very exciting, and we're doing good studies. But these are studies. And there's a study called Dolomona, which is actually not a study, it is a review. There's a clinic in Germany where patients who are suppressed, doing well, 
and have reasons to get rid of the NRTIs are switched to monotherapy dilutegravir. So these are only very good patients, not, you know, and, and most of them had been, had been undetectable. And they went back and they looked at 31 patients where they had 24-week data on what happened when they switched to dilutegravir monotherapy. And actually, 94% of the patients remained undetectable, perfect. One patient decided to, to, to stop on their own, and one patient failed with resistance. Why, how, one, now true, one, that's like, you know, one out of 31, but still, we never see this when we give it as triomega with Truvada. And this tells us we have to be a little bit cautious. And lastly, transmitter resistance. Uh, Charles is here, he's a, the world's expert on transmitter resistance. Maybe during discussion we can, you know, we're, we're starting to think, are we going to have to do integrase resistance before starting a patient, a naive patient on integrase? Usually we do, you know, NRTI and PI. Do we have to add now for all our patients integrase? It's, it's a tough question. So right now I think the best answer is surveillance. We should be doing good surveillance. I know that in, in, uh, Spain is wonderfully organized and has a huge amount of resistance data. This is key. We should all contribute to doing good surveillance to see what's happening with integrase resistance in our city. For example, in Taiwan, where raltegravir was used in different situations, they got 1.2% transmitted resistance. And now they're doing things to change it. So it can happen. So I think how much integrase resistance we will see in transmission will depend on a number of factors, and we can discuss this later. I think which drugs we're going to use. If our first-line drugs are elvitegavir or raltegavir, we might see more. If it's delutegavir, and perhaps if later we have other seconds, it'll be different. Regimens, I think triple, we're pretty safe. Dual, maybe. Mono, I'm not sure. How often you monitor the patients. If you have a patient on raltegavir or elvitegavir, it depends how much you monitor them, how much we'll see. And I think as clinicians, what's our threshold for acting on these low-level viremias? So I think if you have a patient on elvitegavir or raltegavir and you don't act on low-level viremia, we will probably see more. And of course, availability of integrase resistance tests. And we can discuss this, because I think it would be really nice if we didn't have to worry about transmitted integrase inhibitor resistance uh, in the future. So to summarize, first and second generation integrase inhibitors have diverse resistance characteristics. Despite all being very potent, this has implications for their optimal clinical use. Transmitted integrase resistance may likely have a greater impact on first than on second generation agents. So I think if we do have transmitted mutations, it'll have much more impact if we're worthy of a first than a second generation integrase inhibitor. And this continuum surveillance of integrase transmitted drug resistance is of very high importance and we should give it priority uh, in our country. Patients receiving first generation integrase inhibitors need to be monitored for failures as mutations can quickly accumulate, reducing or negating the use of second-generation drugs. And I think this is a, an important point for us uh, as clinicians. Tolerating low-level viremia in patients on first-generation drugs, and this can be first-line or salvage, may lead to loss of subsequent second-generation option. So we should be very careful about leaving a, a patient, even with low-level viremia. Sometimes we have to. But if we don't have to, we should, be, we should try to avoid it. To date, convincing evidence for the lack of resistance upon failure of a second generation integrase inhibitor is available only for dilutegavir in the context of a 2-NRTI regimen. So if folks say, oh, you don't see resistance, yes. When you give dilutegavir to the naive patients with 2-NRTIs, we have tons of data. But all other regimens and all other drugs and all other scenarios still have to be proven. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Que nada que aprovechéis que tenemos dos expertos aquí enormes en inhibidores de la integrasa en resistencias. Somos un grupo relativamente pequeño. No, no os preocupéis, les preguntamos en español o en inglés, como sea. Cualquier pregunta que tengáis podemos empezar. Ahí hay una. Ah, no, está saludando. Sí, sí, sí. 
Dr. Shapiro. Yes, uh, I have a, uh, I'll introduce the question in Spanish for my colleagues. Uh, la pregunta va sobre eh, la característica de los inhibidores de la integrasa respecto a la tasa de disociación del inhibidor de la integrasa del complejo integrasa ADN que se ha relacionado con la barrera genética de los inhibidores de la integrasa y que él no ha mencionado. Um, uh, the dissociation half-life or rate from integrase inhibitors from the complex of ADN or DNA, sorry, DNA and uh, integrase uh, has been mentioned as a characteristic related to the genetic barrier and the potency of these drugs. So, uh, some data show that as, uh, if it is longer, uh, these drugs are more potent and probably with a higher resistance barrier. This was said for dolutegravir, and uh, is being said now for bictegravir. You didn't mention that. Uh, have you had some comments on that? And if you, if you agree on that, could we manipulate the drugs when we are developing them to make these characteristics better? It's an, it's an excellent point. Um, this dissociation is really how long the inhibitor stays on its target. And indeed, a lot of work was done. Uh, one caveat is the first to describe this was actually Merck. Uh, and Merck made a big point uh, how raltegravir is better than elvitegravir. Uh, and the work was very elegant. But in the clinic, it didn't seem to have uh, much behind it. And it is true that raltegravir resistance looks a little better, but despite all the work they did, clinically it wasn't sufficient. Now, it's true that both for dolutegravir and, as you say, bictegravir, there's a lot of very good work done. And I think it is important. Uh, and it also makes sense. I don't know if it's not linked again to the structure. And there may be a connection between these structures uh, which are tighter and therefore it's harder for them to dissociate. It might be a surrogate simply for how low your resistance is. I'm not sure, but it's a good point. Uh, I think the data are convincing. So it's not that I poo-poo it, but I'm a little concerned because there was such a a hoo-ha about raltegravir, uh, I'm not sure. Now, I think the manipulation uh, would be good. Um, a little bit, uh, I think it'll be harder to figure that out than fitting it in. Um, I'm not sure to what degree that has correlated for other drugs. For, so for an integrase inhibitor, it's so. Uh, residency time is something that was looked at, for example, for the CCR5 inhibitors, if you remember, antagonists. I think it's true. I think it's a phenomenon. Um, I think it would be interesting to bring up, perhaps, um, with the drug development folks, if this could be manipulated as another potential um, target for improving resistance further. Good, good comment. Hi, uh, Jonathan. Um, uh, Logo en castellano. Uh, uh, no, le iba a preguntar una mutación muy famosa que hay para dolutegravir es 263K a ver eh, qué opina él y si es una mutación que a los clínicos debe preocuparnos de alguna manera no my question is about uh, if clinicians have to worry about the appearance of 263K uh, against dolutegravir o es just a you know a, a, a lab issue and it's not, it's not for us So that's a great question, um, because there's been a lot of interest in the 263 and actually the 151 mutation. Uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Mark Weinberg, has done a lot of very elegant work, and what's nice is he does it both in the laboratory, but also correlates clinically. And these are interesting mutations, because it's clear that the virus has two challenges um, when it wants to become resistant. One, it doesn't want the drug to work but it does want the enzyme to work. So there's a trade-off between becoming more resistant, but keeping fit, having your replication continue. And often if you have mutations which are very nasty, um, then they also cripple the enzyme and it doesn't work well. For example, the 148 that I showed you, it's very potent, but the enzyme doesn't work very well. So what do we often see with the 148? we see the 140 come in. And what's the job of the 140? The job of the 140 is to compensate 
for the 148. So they each have a job. 148 gives the resistance, 140 fixes the replication, and together we have a resistant virus that is replicating. And this is with the 263. So the question is, you know, there's a mutation that we see, but we don't see a lot of resistance. So why is it there? So it's doing something good for the virus. Either it's giving a little resistance, which in the future will allow it to give more, or maybe it's affecting replication. In fact, when it comes with 151, it's even more complicated because maybe together they're doing something which will complement each other. Now, when we look into laboratory, we don't see much of an effect. My personal view is because our tools aren't good enough. I trust the virus. If the virus is doing it, there's a reason, and it's bad. So when we two, see 263, it means the virus has been able to make some changes towards resistance. For example, we saw in studies where we took patients who were naive to integrase, but were not completely naive. So I think this is the first mini step that the virus is taking, and I don't like it. Uh, what will happen ultimately if we'll start seeing a lot of this, I don't know. Um, I think a, a virus with 263 doesn't mean you can't give delotegravir, but perhaps I would, be ve I would never give monotherapy in a, in a virus like that. And I think that as our tools get better, we'll know more. Actually, in protease inhibitors, um, the first to describe this was Charles. This was, I think, 20 years ago for atonavir. You took a virus and you showed the mutations, what, at 70 coming in, uh, 71, and... Uh, so, and I'll try, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the 263 story. So, so we do a, a, a trial in Rotterdam um, where we select uh, patients who were long-term suppressed and are compliant, etc. So the ideal patients, and we, we, we switch them to a dolutegravir monotherapy. Uh, and most of the patients are doing well, but we had a few failures. Um, and one of the failures that we had had the 263 developed. So this, I think, the first one in the world of a naive integrase that selects 263, but it was typical low-level replication, the reason being that it gives only low-level resistance and we don't know what the replication capacity is. And the, the reason, there is a potential explanation why this developed in this patient, because he may have problems actually absorbing the drug to high enough concentrations. So I think it's a potential risk. Uh, it happens, it can happen in real life. To what extent it's a large uh, uh, risk for normal clinical practice, I don't know. But in clinical trials where dolutegravir was combined with a proper background therapy, it has never been observed. Um, Siguiendo con la 263K, hasta que has mencionado este ensayo clínico, en los estudios de monoterapia, cuando hemos visto fracasos, no hemos visto la 263K. I'm asking, Jonathan, this is the first time I've heard a monotherapy study with dolutegravir seen to 63K. My always surprise is that when um, they did it in the lab with all these serial passages, you saw do 63K, but in these studies of monotherapy, you are not seeing it. Uh, so what was the, what, what's the reason for that? Uh, sorry. I think, first of all, if you, the in vitro studies show the 151, 153, and the 260, 151 and 260. So depending on what study you take, there's different solutions. But as Jonathan pointed out, the, the IC50 change conferred by the 263 is, is low. In the, in the, it's like twofold. So I think it, it's actually quite difficult to select for this 263 in FIFO because you need like an, a low concentration of drug. If it's high, you suppress it. If it's not there, you won't find it. So you really have to, to you know, do your best to select for it. Uh, right, so it's it's similar to to we have seen some failures for with um, with the boosted PIs where the same happened in in, in some patients we selected single mutations uh, as a reason of, of of low level. So and, and I think but that's I think the, the, the problem with all the monotherapy studies, as you know, you, you the, by by definition if you do mono, monotherapy you don't protect the drug against resistance, so you lose the background activity. So I think the triple helps you to prevent the 263 to develop, but in FIFO, if you do your best, you can select for it.
And we actually so we see some other patterns too. So I don't think we know the full resistance pattern for dorotegravir either. Es en relación con una reciente publicación que señala que los pacientes con la mutación K65R y 184 se previene el desarrollo de mutaciones o de complicaciones con dolutegravir, pero no con otros inhibidores de la integrasa. Saber si esto tiene alguna implicación clínica. Y no recent publication, son authors suggest that patient having the mutation K65 or N184 prevent the development of mutation or resistance against dorotegravir but no other inhibitor, integrase inhibitor. What is your opinion about Yeah, fascinating. So uh, this is really a fascinating story which has been going for a long time. And it's, it, these two mutations, 184V and K65R, are both important potent mutations. And since they're port, potent mutations, they cripple the virus. And we know that 184 has a huge impact on 3TC and m -tricitabine. And K65R, the biggest impact on drugs like tenofovir. So not surprisingly, they cripple the virus. And we know from work long ago that when you put these two together, the virus replicates very poorly. In fact, there's an article from about 15 years ago from, from our colleague Mark Weinberg. Actually, before we even had drugs, he said, if you put those two together, the virus is dead. It just won't be able to replicate. Now, it was good laboratory work, but apparently the virus always wins. So somewhere else it makes a change which compensates because we do have patients with K65R and 184. I think their viral load doesn't shoot up very high, but they fail and the virus can replicate. Uh, maybe this is part of the story that keeping a patient on 3TC or FTC has benefit. This may be some of the story, but definitely this is a virus which does not replicate well. And this fascinating question, you know, will this protect um, from getting resistance to other drugs? And looking here, um, it appeared that drugs where there's a difficulty to get resistance like dolutegravir, it had a very protective effect. But on raltegravir, that it was easier, uh, it had less than effect. So I think it's, I think it's a fascinating article. I, I, think it's, um, I think it makes sense. I think clinically, um, It may, it may have some value. I'll tell you why I'm a little bit biased. There's a difference between giving um, tenofovir and emtricitabine or giving a bacavir and lamivudine. And it has to do with the 184. 184 uh, is not a good mutation for tenofovir, but it is for a bacavir. And it may be that by combining those two and forcing the virus to get uh, both of these mutations, we make it even harder for it to get resistance uh, to delotegavir. I don't think it's a major clinical issue, but I think it does again make the point how giving the two NRTIs provides protection, and it provides good protection uh, for delotegavir, but probably when you have low genetic barrier drugs like rotegavir and elvitegavir, it doesn't. Uh, th that would be my take. I know, Charles, you have? Yeah. Jose? Una pregunta sencilla, si en vuestra opinión habrá resistencia cruzada entre dolutegravir y bictegravir. There will be cross resistance between bictegravir and dolutegravir. So this, this is exciting. I'm very excited about this, having these two. I mean, I look at these data, I mean, Jose is teasing me now because this is, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. How this will translate into cross-resistance, you know, the, the minute we see this, I say to myself, it's all going to be the same. But there's a lot going on here. I'm, you know, I, I understand tomorrow there's a, a, a soccer game between Real and Atletico. That's not exciting. This is exciting, right? <laughs> this, this is what matters. This is, this is passion in life, okay? So look, look what's going on here. Not only do we have the resistance characteristics, we have the pharmacology. Okay, so on the one hand, Bictegravir looked like, you know, 
it's a very potent drug, but we're giving twice as much. On the other hand, its half-life looks longer. It was, I think, 20 hours and not 15. So maybe its tail will be longer. On the other hand, with dilutegravir, we give it twice a day in resistant patients, and I'm fascinated to see if indeed we will see cross-resistance or if there'll be subtle differences. For example, the 138, that is a nasty mutation. You know, when you get, the, the 138 has been seen, by the way, a lot. When you get 140, 148 and 138, I, I don't sleep at night. That, that's terrible when a patient gets that. What will be the cross-resistance? And if the company was able to manipulate even that, I think that would be amazing. So, Jose, this is, you know, actually, David, um, you'll be speaking a little bit. I mean, this, you know, we're looking just at resistance, but it's much more complicated than like that. And also, I think that um, right now, I don't see any development of Bictegravir at any dose but 100. You know, and, and, and by the way, some of us, uh, and Jose definitely has a lot of experience, you know, giving Dilutegravir 100 twice a day instead of 50 twice a day also is sometimes a solution we look at in patients who have this. I'm even thrilled to see if increasing the doses of Bictegravir and Dilutegravir will have cross-resistance or will have difference. So I think for us as clinicians, I mean, th there will be a few steps. My first step is to see that Cabotegravir and Bictegravir prove themselves as Dilutegravir did. I have a bet, as many of us do with Mark Weinberg, that I'm losing. I was sure we would see resistance to Triumeg. And I was up to now wrong. I was sure, sure, I mean, I was sure, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna lose that bet. I wanna see that for Cabo, and I wanna see that for Bic, because that, there may be something going on. And then I think this cross-resistance will be, will, it's also important for us for resistance testing. Because remember with protease inhibitors, we spent a lot of time when we were looking at the failures, remember with sequinavir, if you can still give lopinavir with the lopinavir score and the darunavir score. Are we gonna have different scores for dilutegravir and bictegravir? So are we gonna have integrase failures? I hope so, because then resistance people like Charles and I won't just disappear, right? And then you'll look at it and you'll say, mmm, what should I get? Where's Jonathan? Where's Charles? I'm gonna give them money to get... This is, this is fascinating, Jose. W what, will we need scores for these two, or is it just going to be a wash? Is it just going to be, once you've developed three mutations, we're done? Great question. Yeah, um, a question for Charles. Um, I'll introduce it in Spanish. Uh, la pregunta tiene que ver con eh, la característica que ha comentado de los inhibidores de la integrasa de también inhibir la maduración del virus y qué consecuencias puede tener esto en la medición de la carga vírica. Um, you, you told us that uh, the interase inhibitors also are maturation inhibitors, or they, they intervene in the maturation of the virus. So, does it have any consequence of the measure of the viral load? Uh, in the sense that uh, it was said with the protease inhibitors that uh, we could measure this immature vir virus in the plasma, when using them, and this could confound us uh, in the viral load sometimes. So, mm -hmm. it could be the same with 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 the integrative inhibitors, or or the differences no, I, because I, where they 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 play. But perhaps I didn't express myself clearly, but it, it's not all the in integration inhibitors. So the strong transfer inhibitors that we use in the clinic, they only inhibit the integration. But it's through using the alinis, the new class. There we found that they act also later on, and the mechanism of how they work is because they interfere with maturation of the virus. And for this maturation, you need four integrase molecules properly assigned to each other, and that doesn't happen if the alinis are there. So for the clinic, at least with this class, there is no impact on measuring the RNA response. I have a, a question, if, if, if I may. So, you know, um, there are, are trade-offs between using more and less drugs. I'm very conservative, and I like using more. And Jose is very open-minded and has done amazing things using less, saving toxicity, saving money, allowing more patients to be treated. We have a new drug now, Bictegravir. Okay, and obviously the company right now is controlling it, but it's not gonna control it forever. So 
Spain, uh, and specifically Madrid, but also Barcelona, have done more work on monotherapy than anywhere by far. And basically, all the guidelines are based on the work done here. So my question to you, Jose, and your colleagues who do the work, um, we have big tech over here. How should we study it instead of playing catch up later? If we want to consider how can we use big Tegavir optimally? Are there situations where we can use it alone, maybe as an induction maintenance? Should we be using it maybe with just one cheap drug like 3TC? What would be some of the, the approach you'd take? Uh, we have a new agent. What should we be doing as investigators to try to tease out how best to use it and not just have the companies lead us all the time? Uh, what are some of the concepts you'd apply? The roadmap to play with the number of drugs is starts with showing that in triple therapy you don't see resistance. So, as you mentioned, with dolutegravir we have such a wealth of data that uh, when you use it in, in triple therapy you don't see resistance. That's when people can remember, you know, all the editorials of the accompanying the papers of dolutegravir mention. Well, this looks like it's behaving like a PI. Why don't we play with the number of drugs? But always, in my opinion, is that the need right now is much less than it used to be. You know, when we started, Federico is there, when we started the monotherapy studies, we, fight, we fought against ACT, DD4, TDDI. So now I will be extremely cautious, cautious of how to, you know, approach that. I think it's fun, it's easy to prove it scientifically, but I think I have to see first with Big Tegravir that we don't see resistance in, in triple. At, at the same time, we also have a, a new population of patients that we treat almost from the beginning, right? So would that influence your decision at all? Or? Like that, I mean, basically, if you, if you treat from the beginning, the variability of the population of viruses is reduced. Okay. So theoretically, you may get away with a lower genetic barrier regimen than another one. Yeah, well, that's it. I think... That's a great point. I, I don't think, you know, after seeing recent data, I don't know if what we learned about resistance and archive resistance, and when you treat patients so early, and when you do kind of induction maintenance, if all the population is there archived or not. We just saw the Moby Deep study in Glasgow with archive 184B, and apparently 3TC still work. So, I don't know, it's a good question, Charles. Yeah, I think the, the problem with the archive mutations is we now, I think there's a problem with the phylogical anal analysis because we now know that from the cure studies, we know that 98% of all the archived DNA is dead virus. So finding a mutation in archived viruses is, is tricky. Not always it, 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 it implies true re resistant virus, right? So I'm not surprised to find that sometimes a drug works, works even if in the archive you find mutations because then these viruses are are simply dead pro-virus. So, the, you know, from your talk, the pregunta, Charles, if, si lo entendí bien, cuando presentaste la comparación entre raltegravir y efavirenz, dijiste que los inhibidores de la integrasa son más potentes porque tienen más tiempo para actuar. Cuando ya acaba la transcripción, todavía está la integración. Pero siguiendo esa lógica, los inhibidores de la proteasa deberían ser los más potentes porque actúan todavía más tarde. If I got it right, Charles, you said that integrase inhibitors are more potent than non-nucleosides or reverse transcriptase inhibitors because the window of opportunity to work is longer. When transcription has ended, you still have uh, sure. activity. Then following that logic, PIs should be even more potent because they yes, uh, work so downstream. Sure. If you would strictly look at, at that, then you would argue that the PIs should be equally effective as the others. And then the fact that they are not implies that there's another mechanism involved explaining that the PIs don't do this, and I don't know what the mechanism is, but that could be a pharmacological issue. But that needs further inv investigation too. Una pregunta más. So the last one, just a curiosity, Charles, ¿por qué se tardaron tanto en encontrar inhibidores de la integrasa? Why, why it took so long to develop integrase inhibitors when the target was so well, 
I'm not sure that it took long to... I, I think one reason is that the RT inhibitors came from oncology, right? The, the molecules were there to start with. Um, and I think the protease inhibitors also profit from work was, which was done with other proteases uh, um, and structures, like the, like the blood, high, blood, high blood pressure is also uh, working on proteases. The integrase was a, new, was a new molecule. We don't have integrases, so they, they had to start from the beginning there. So that delayed the process somewhat. Just an interesting story. You know, there was an integrase inhibitor in 96 or 97 in San Francisco. Um, there was, it was an integrase inhibitor, uh, and it actually reached a clinic. I'm not sure if it was 96 or 97, and it was developed simply by screening molecules. And they found that this molecule, and actually the company took it, I think, into phase one or maybe the beginning of phase two. It failed miserably, both on um, pharmacology and resistance, but it, it did inhibit um, the enzyme. Now, what ultimately, um, I think that's when Merck started their development program. I think probably what happened is what Charles described here, those five steps weren't known. We didn't really know the science behind it. Later, I think, when they realized the science, they realized that that inhibitor was inhibiting a non-rate limiting step. So I think, was, I, I think it was the science had to catch up. I think the science was simply not there. And I think specifically, even today, maybe, I remember, remember the LEDGIF? First they said it worked like this, then they said they worked it like this, then they opened one company in Belgium, then they opened one company here. So I, I, you know, just to, to congratulate the scientists, I think it was the scientists understanding how it worked, and only then we could design the molecule. Bueno, pues con esto damos por concluida esta interesante sesión. Os recuerdo que ahora hay un café y que la siguiente sesión empieza ahora otra vez a las, a las cuatro y cuarto. Muchas gracias a todos.